she said, you know, as I'm an artist, I'm a sensitive person, and you talk about places you go and places you've seen and countries that I have no chance of ever visiting, and I find it really painful. This is Cold War Conversations. Massive Soviet military forces have invaded the small, non-aligned, sovereign nation of Afghanistan. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Sue Boyd has been the head of Australian diplomatic missions in Fiji, Hong Kong, Vietnam and Bangladesh. She also had postings at the United Nations in New York and the former East Germany. Sue was posted to East Germany in 1976 and tells us of her work, friendships and life as a single woman in the diplomatic community of 1970s East Berlin. She reveals the fascinating contents of her Stasi file, detailing the intense surveillance she was under, as well as confirmation of some of her suspicions. But also there's some surprise revelations too. Now, it does take a lot of effort and expense to produce this podcast, and I could really do with some help to support my work. So, if you want to help preserve Cold War history, then for only about $3, £3 or €3 Euros a month, you can help keep us on the air. Larger amounts are always welcome. Plus, you get a sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a monthly financial supporter and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. So back to today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Sue Boyd to our Cold War Conversation. Before we begin this week's episode, I want to highlight our friends at the Cold War channel on YouTube. I've been watching their quality videos for some time and I highly recommend them. The videos are presented in an easily digestible format and cover some fascinating and sometimes little known Cold War subjects. From the Kishtim disaster, the biggest nuclear disaster before Chernobyl, to the anti-Soviet guerrilla war in the Baltics, the episodes on Cold War TV provide a fantastic insight into areas of the Cold War not covered elsewhere. Just search for Cold War TV on YouTube. And now, back to our episode. Um, I joined uh, the Australian Foreign Service um, straight from university. I did my degree and I did a postgraduate diploma in education. Uh, and then I was recruited into the Department of External Affairs, it was then. Um, and so after a year of training in Canberra, I was sent to my first post, which was Portugal. And I went to Portugal and I was there right up to the revolution, um, which was an interesting time to be in Portugal um, because I had really looked at Portugal's colonial policy and what it was doing and stuff, and which was of interest to Australia. That was our main interest in Portugal because they were some, one of the last powers to divest themselves of their colonial possessions, if you remember. So that mm. was an in of interest to us. And so I came back. Um, interestingly enough, I came back from Portugal. I, I went through Angola and Mozambique on the way home and talked to friends of mine there and sort of got a feeling of what, what people in the colonies thought uh, about what was happening. And I got back to Canberra actually the day the revolution happened. Uh, and I was uh, in the West Europe section in the department. And, of course, they wanted to know I was the first person back from Portugal. It had been a, a new embassy. And so they, we got a call from the Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, to send them someone who could tell him what the revolution was about and what was happening. And so they said, well, listen, Sue, you better go. You're the newest one back. But I was also the youngest. I was a very junior officer at that stage. So anyway, I went over you know, to, the, to, to, to Parliament House and walked into the Prime Minister's office. 
and he boomed at me. He said, Susan, he said, now tell me, what's going on in Portugal? And what does it mean for Australia? And what should we do about it? And uh, so, well, you know, that's that was my brief. So I filled him in on what was happening. And um, he was obviously happy with that. And I must say, he was a very strong supporter of mine through the whole of my career. I was very grateful to him. But we had that excellent start, which was quite handy for a young officer in the Foreign Service. So then having come back from Portugal, of course, Timor became the issue that was of real interest to Australia. And uh, so I spent the next... Um, year and a half, really, working on Timor. And I was working in Darwin. We established an, an interim office there. So I worked with the Portuguese Peace Mission and worked with uh, refugees and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, Canberra rang me up and said, listen, you can stop thinking about um, Timor now because we want you to go to East Germany. It's just out of the blue. Uh, and why? Because we suddenly had a gap in the embassy and they needed someone and they saw on my CV that I spoke German. I thought I was a good fit, so I said, so pack your bags and off you go to East Germany. So I said, well, hang on, hang on. I haven't spoken German for some time and I need a refresher. Um, so they said, all right, we'll send you to the Goethe Institute at Göttingen and you can do a refresher course there. And uh, So I did that first and then joined the embassy in, uh, in uh, 1976. Right. And, and your role there is first secretary and deputy head of mission. What What? What does that mean in diplomatic terms? Well, um, it was a small embassy. So, of course, the ambassador was head of it, Malcolm Morris. And then under Malcolm Morris, um, I was the most um, senior officer um, because we only – it was very small. We only really had two of us on the political side. So I was it. I was his deputy and I was the first secretary. Uh, we had other staff there, someone who looked after the consular matters, for example, and someone who looked after communications uh, and a secretary – two secretaries, um, and we had also a trade commissioner because we had trade interests in the GDR. Um, so we had trade staff. So it was a relatively small embassy, but really you know, I was the most senior senior staff under the ambassador. Right, right. And I've, I've, I've seen some photos of the office you had uh, in its ruined state as it is uh, yes, sad. nowadays. But this was purpose-built for Australia, wasn't it? It was. It was. Because, you see, we were a bit special. I mean, Goff was one of the – we were one of the first com countries to recognize the GDR and to say we were going to establish an embassy there. Um, and he, he, the Prime Minister announced in 1973 that we were going to recognize the GDR, which was well ahead of the PAC. Um, the, the two Germanys had started talking to each other about normalizing regulations and establishing a Ständiger Vertretung in each other's capital. Um, but really, we were one of the very earliest ones in there. So they built a special embassy building for us in um, Niederschönhausen, which was a little bit out of the centre. And they built also a special residence for the ambassador, also in Niederschönhausen. And also they set aside um, a, a very nice house, an old house, probably been built in the 20s or 30s, um, for me, for the, the, the first secretary. And uh, that, was, that was lovely. It was in Platanenstraße, which is very, by the names, it was a very leafy street um, in a very nice suburb and a uh, very nice house. It had uh, really four stories. It was a huge house, really, for, for just me by myself. Um, and that, then they gave us all that. That's what they gave us. And then in the embassy building, we had two apartments that were part of the part of the building. So we had the office there and two apartments. So we were well housed, really. It must have been some novelty to have a single woman as first secretary as well. It was um, for everybody, really. And um, so there were sort of implications of that, um, firstly with my own government, because we at that stage had a, a sort of regulation that um, diplomats in the East Bloc were not allowed to travel around unaccompanied. They thought we might get set up in you know, situations which might compromise us and for security reasons we should always be accompanied. But as I said to my ambassador, listen, this is ridiculous. I can't do my job if I've always got to find someone to travel with me because, I mean, I'm a single officer. I don't have a husband. I don't have someone convenient to take with me places. And if I've got to always have someone with me, well, it really limits my 
you know, my capacity to do my job. So, um, so he said, yeah, well, you're quite right, really, and you're a sensible girl, so I'm sure you won't get yourself into difficult situations. And so he went back to Canberra and said, listen, we should make a special arrangement for Sue. She needs to be able to travel unaccompanied. Um, and so they said, okay, you can do it. So that was the first, that was the first thing. So I was allowed to um, be, be unaccompanied. And that was fantastic because it meant I could travel around freely around East Germany. I traveled to lots of places, met lots of people, had lots of great experiences. But I could also travel unaccompanied through the East Bloc. And that was really quite rare. So I went, for example, we had an embassy in Warsaw. So I drove by myself across Poland and um, visited them. And then we traveled around Poland by ourselves. And I, I went to Czechoslovakia by myself. I went to Prague. Um, I drove all the way down to Vienna uh, by myself. You know, and I went to the Soviet Union by myself. I stayed there with our embassy and I traveled with my, our embassy people. But it was just a great freedom. But of course, this made me, um, it was highly suspicious for the East Germans because here was I sort of behaving in a way that was not like the way other diplomats behaved. Other diplomats, other Western diplomats, always were accompanied by somebody when they traveled. So they thought, well, you know, she must be something different. She must be a spy. She must be an intelligent agent. And so in my Stasi file, it says quite clearly that the reason they established um, surveillance of me was to establish whether I was an intelligence officer or not. Uh, and so halfway through my time, they, uh, they reviewed the operation against me, the Shazi, and they concluded that, in fact, I wasn't uh, an, in, uh, an intelligence officer. But they said they should continue to keep me under surveillance because I had a lot of friends in friendly embassies who were intelligence officers, and I spent quite a lot of time with them. So therefore, it was worth keeping tabs on me as well. So it was a, an interesting and a unique situation I was in. Yes, yeah, absolutely, and uh, we'll come on to the details of your Stasi file uh, in a in a in a moment. Um, so you're talking about the the other diplomats that that you worked with. How different were the attitudes of the diplomats of the other Warsaw Pact countries in in terms of their nationalities? I mean, was the you know the Romanian diplomats uh, different from the Soviet or the Polish diplomats? What, what, how, how were they different? Yes, no, well, that's, that was interesting to me because I re what my mission was, what we were there to do um, was first to look after trade, but also to understand um, what the situation was in the East Bloc, to keep an eye on what was happening in the Soviet Union to the extent that we could pick it up from a distance, to understand what was happening in the other East Bloc states and explain that back to Canberra. That was, that was part of what I was doing. Um, but I was really, because I, I was really very ignorant about the region. I hadn't done any study of it. But I found, of course, that countries like Romania and Hungary, their diplomats, of course, their relationships with the Soviet Union were very uh, were different relations. They were very uh, proud of their own independent standing and of their independent heritage and their and their history and their own separate languages. And so they were very, very much happy to be seen as um, individuals and not necessarily linked at all to the Soviet Union to the extent that one could manage that. And they recognized that they, they all were part of the East Bloc and they all had a relationship with the Soviet Union, but that wasn't actually really very important. That really didn't get in the way of their, their natural tendencies. So they were very open and very friendly and very happy to explain things to me and sort of help educate me into the realities of life in the East Bloc. Um, you know, as compared with the Russians themselves who were, um, you know, you have to remember also the Russians were actually hated by the East Germans. I mean, it was a relationship of occupation and the Russians had behaved appallingly when they occupied Berlin after the war and those memories hadn't gone away. So the, the East Germans were not actually terribly, didn't love the Russians, but it was a relationship of they just had to get on with it and had to live with them and it was a, a reality of life. 
Um, but the other uh, East Bloc countries obviously had different relations. The Poles were also very proud of being Polish. Um, and their connections with the Soviet Union, well, that's something you just had to put up with, you know. There was a reality of life. But in the meantime, you, you got on with being Polish. And I found that um, very interesting. Really, most of the East Bloc countries had that attitude of having to tolerate a relationship with the Soviet Union, but by no means loving them. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting that, that those different types there, because during the period you were there, Romania was still being wooed by the by the West at that point, I think. Yes, and 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 you know Hungary had a very close relationship, obviously, with Austria. I mean, they're part of the old the old empire, um, and those relationships were still strong and and vibrant. And I was hugely struck when I went to Budapest for the first time about how open the place was, how lovely the cafes were and the restaurants and people sitting on the street and people chatting openly to each other and the artworks were flourishing. And when we met officials, because I was there partly in an official capacity, you know, how open and friendly they were. You know, as compared with my counterparts in the in the GDR, when I talked to people in the foreign ministry, I mean, they were very close and shuttered and not at all open and very correct and very careful. And uh, I think they were quite shocked but to, to be faced with me because I wasn't open. I, wa- I was very open. I wasn't particularly careful. You know, I was happy to treat people as they were and I, I expected people to treat me as I was and I wasn't up to anything wrong. And, you know, I was a friendly, outgoing person and I rather expect other people to be friendly and outgoing as well. So I think they found that a bit surprising. Did you meet any of the the senior GDR officials, or was that the ambassador's role to meet with like Politburo members? No, that was really the ambassador's role. So my contacts were really foreign ministry people and people in other ministries, like the culture ministry um, and information ministry. So, but who, who we had relationships with because I was responsible for running our culture and information program. That was also part of my responsibilities. So my job was to try and help people in the GDR understand about Australia and what we were about. Um, and so I worked hard with journalists and uh, people to place material about Australia, not political material, but stuff that just – let people understand what sort of people we were and um and that's so that was sort of harmless stuff and you know to begin with people were a bit suspicious about that but then they realized that's that's actually all it was and it was essentially quite interesting i wasn't trying to subvert them i wasn't trying to convert them to our political positions you know that wasn't my job i wasn't there to undermine uh, the gdr i was just there to do what we were doing, which was a normal diplomatic role. And that, I think, was quite interesting for them to have to work out that I wasn't there trying to subvert them. Yeah, yeah. What did you do in your your spare time then? Well, um, I I travelled around quite a lot at weekends. Um, I was interested in music. I went to concerts. Tickets were very cheap for anything cultural. First-class music, first-class orchestras and, and opera companies and and uh, theatre, I went to all those things. And because I, because I speak quite good German, um, all that was very accessible to me. You know, I could just go and be there and take it all in. And then I developed a lot of friendships. Um, I had friends amongst the other diplomats, um, and I had some friends in West Berlin. I developed some friendships with uh, people from uh, the British military, particularly on the other side. Um, That was quite interesting how that came about because we had no official relationship with the military. Um, That wasn't our role. Um, But I was a keen squash player and I was looking to find a squash court. And I discovered that the only squash courts in Berlin, as far as I could find out, were in the Olympic Stadium, which was where the British, British Army had their headquarters. And so I, I sort of put out feelers to see whether I could be allowed to play squash there. And they said, well, it is a military installation, and but we're very happy to host you if you'd like to come and have a, a game of squash. And here's a, a sort of young officer from the parachute regiment who's designated to look after you and help you. So I went over and met this young fellow, and he said, well, I'll give you a game of squash. So we got in there, and we had a game of squash, and I actually thrashed him. It was a bit embarrassing, but I actually <laughs> thrashed him. 
Uh, well anyway, done. <laughs> yes, but he'd invited me to stay on and have dinner in the mess afterwards. So I went and had dinner in the mess. And, of course, everybody else said, oh, how did you go? How did you go? And he said, oh, well, she thrashed me, you know. So that was a bit uh, shaming. So one of another officer came up to our table and said, I see, you're a good squash player, are you? Well, I'm prepared to give you a game. Will you give me a game? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we lined up a game, and he absolutely wiped the court with me. It was absolute vengeance, and the honour of the army had been upheld. This upstart Australian wasn't going to wipe the floor with them, you know. Anyway, we started a relationship. We became quite close. We had dinner together, and um, I travelled with him and went, visited his parents and you know, we got quite close and through that I really met all his friends and met the army people um, and got to know sort of that side of life. So the relationships were entirely sort of social but all those sort of things took up a bit of my time. Yeah, well, I, I was interested to see that you you built up quite a relationship with some of the members of of Bricksmiths. Yet the Stasi failed to pick up on that rather critical piece of information. Yeah, it was interesting because again, I'm not entirely sure how I did meet the Bricksmiths people, but I think possibly through my connections with Two Para. But uh, anyway, they they of course came over and roamed around quite freely around um, about around Berlin around the East, the East Berlin and uh, they were sort of lovely young fellows you know they were sort of energetic and young and full of daring do and yeah, as we know from what Mark was saying you know they weren't held back by any any boundaries I mean a sign that said members of foreign military missions are not allowed in here was just an invitation for them to go in and see what was going on and sort of take down the signs and I was given one of those same signs that Mark was given uh, and uh, and, they, and they wanted you know to come to the opera and to they wanted to come to concerts. So I was very happy to go with them and partner them. And they we became good friends. And they I was interested in what they were doing and they were telling me what they were up to. And um, and I was invited to a lovely dinner at their sort of headquarters on a beautiful lake just outside Berlin. And I was having dinner with them there one winter night and um, we looked out on the lake and it was a full moon and skating across the lake was an old couple, arm in arm, um, on wooden skates. He was carrying a lantern. They both had long coats and they were just blissfully skating over the lake under this moon. And it was just one of those fantastic sort of memories that stays with you for the rest of your life. Just gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's a, a lovely image you've you've painted there. I I think on one of your trips to uh, see a classical music concert, you strike up a friendship with the wife of the leader of the second violins in the Staatskapelle. Absolutely, yes. That, that, well, that was actually my second day um, in Berlin. I mean, I'd arrived uh, and I was you know, settled in my house, but. Um, you know, I didn't know anybody. And uh, somebody in the embassy said to me, listen, here we've got some tickets. Why don't you take these tickets and go to this concert? Because this music is fantastic and you'll enjoy it. So I took the ticket, which was was given, given to me, um, and I went. And I found myself uh, sitting next to this woman who was very nice and she was very friendly and started to chat to me. And I thought, hello, this is a bit suspicious. You know, these tickets have been allocated to the Australian embassy and we've got this woman sitting next to me who's chatting me up you know I mean maybe she's trying to compromise me you know so I was I was friendly but just slightly cautious anyway we did we got on together and we chatted a lot and her name was Karen Peters and she said to me um I said, you know, they're a good-looking lot in this orchestra, aren't they? And she said, yeah, what do you think about that one up there? And she pointed to him, and I said, oh, he's quite quite spunky. She said, yeah, well, that's my husband. <laughs> 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 he was the leader of the second, second, second violin. So anyway, so we got on well, and she said, let's go and have a drink afterwards, and her husband came and joined us, so I met them both. And they were both very charming and very nice, but I still was suspicious. I still thought this might be a setup, you know. So I didn't then – then we exchanged information and contact details. But I didn't do anything – I didn't do anything more about them and they didn't contact me until a couple of months later when, as the cultural affairs officer in the embassy, I had to organize a couple of concerts for a visiting a musical 
classical musical group from Australia under the Cultural Relations Program. And I needed to find an audience for them, so I sort of contacted everybody I knew. And I thought, oh, there's that nice couple from the, from the Staatskapelle, I'll ask them. So they came, and they were very happy to come, and uh, it was great to see them again. And then after that, they said, well, would you like to come to our place? And I thought, well, why not, really? They seem very nice, and they seem genuine, and it gives me an opportunity to get to know some East Germans and get to know how they live and see how they live and get to know a family. So that's how it began. And they became really terrific friends and friends, friends to this day. That that's that that's really interesting. I mean, did you you talked about you know being wary of contacts and uh, you know being being set up? Did you feel that you were under surveillance? Oh, I knew I was under surveillance. I expected to be under surveillance. I mean, I knew what the realities of life were in the GDR. So I really expected to be under surveillance all the time. And it didn't worry me. I thought, there's nothing I'm doing which I mind anybody else knowing about. And so if that's a fact of life, you know, well, I'll, well, I'll just live with that. I mean, I expected that my house was bugged. I expected that my telephone was bugged. Every time I talked to Mark on the phone, I knew that we were being recorded. You know, but I, but I just thought, well, this is the way it is. I just have to accept this and not let it get in the way. I just have to get on with life. Uh, and that was my attitude to it. So it was also when, therefore, I knew also that it was illegal for East German citizens to have um, contacts with Western diplomats unless they had authorization to do so. And so any contacts that I was able to develop relationships with, I just assumed that they had to report on me. And I, I could see that there was a, a, a value to them in having contact with me, but the price they had to pay for that relationship was they had to report on me. And sort of I knew that's what the deal was, and they knew that I knew, so we just got on with life. And it, and it was interesting to read my file later to find out that's exactly what that supposition, that, that, had, been, that had been right, that's what had been going on. Yeah, because I think you, you, you in in the notes you sent me at at the time you you had a conversation with your boiler man gardener, which was quite interesting. It was. That was a little bit further down the track. We were busy planting stuff in the garden because he was also a gardener, and he asked me about um, things in in West Berlin. You know, he said, uh, "Is the KDW still there? The big department store? You know, is?" this church still there is this there and I said well yes all this but I said but um surely you're you're of an age you know because he was quite old surely you're of an age that they allow you now to go to the west I said because I mean you're not a Geheimnisträger you know that's the person that's has access to official secrets and he said, doch, doch, das bin ich, das bin ich, ich bin doch ein Geheimnisträger. So he sort of admitted that he was uh, in that category. And so I assumed all the time that he had been the chap who changed the tapes in the basement of my house or let people in who did that or whatever. I, I knew he wasn't just the boiler man and just the gardener. Um, but he confirmed himself that he was a Geheimnisträger. So, yeah, interesting. Very, very much so, <laughs> and the the detail in your in your Stasi file, I I did find fascinating and quite hilarious at 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 the same time. Now, obviously, they they suspected you of being some form of in, intelligence agent, but there there were members of the Australian embassy's local staff who were reporting on you to the Stasi. So these were East Germans employed by the Australian embassy. Absolutely. There were two of them, particularly, who were nominated as being responsible for reporting on me. Um, one was the ambassador's driver, because obviously he sort of knew where we were going and what we were doing. And the other one was our receptionist, because she also was the one who helped to make arrangements when I travelled outside. So, you know, they were the source of information on our movements. Uh, and they would have reported if there were any untoward, you know, relationships I was developing or whatever. Um, so, yeah, that, so those two were actually employed by Stasi and required to, do, required to report on us. And our interpreter, Frau Precht, 
who was I was quite close to her, and I always assumed that because she was our interpreter that and she'd been given to us by the East Germans, as had all our local staff, I always assumed that she'd been reporting on us too. But I got to know her very well later when I went back to Berlin afterwards, and it wasn't true at all. The interesting story is that she had refused to work for Stasi while working with us. So she'd kept her kept herself independent, and uh, that was an interesting finding, that you could refuse to do the work if they asked you to do it. Right, yeah, because you also talk about quite an interesting story about a friend of hers as well who refused to work for the Stasi and use yes. uh, a legal, legal means to uh, avoid it. Absolutely. I mean, she introduced me to her friend. They'd been um, at, at the uh, Leipzig at university together, both foreign language students. And, uh, and uh, so she had, you know, come, ended up with us, but the friend had, was ending, it was then a tour guide in Leipzig. And I went back to, went to Leipzig and went to meet her and she uh, took me around, but also we talked a lot. And indeed, she had also, she'd been a school teacher and they, uh, Stasi had tried to recruit her to be a spy and she'd refused she spoke foreign languages, and, but she said no, she wasn't going to. So they really put the hard word on her to make her uh, fit in with their plans. And so they, she said that she got sacked from her job at the school. You know, her income was cut off. Her family was harassed. But she said there, she, there were provisions in the East German laws, and they were quite a legalistic lot. And she used those laws to fight them, to say, you don't have the right to do this to me. You don't have the right to terminate my employment. You know, I'm a member of the union. You know, I'm a proper teacher. And so she had used everything that she could and she'd succeeded. Um, so she'd managed to get reinstated and managed to get her back pay and so on. Um, so it was interesting to see that people could actually use the legal system uh, for protection. That is really interesting because I think that the common view is the Stasi was sort of like this irresistible force that, you know, if you were asked to work for them, then you, you had to, otherwise there'd be really severe consequences. Well, that's right. And, you know, I mean, I think I told you in, in, in my book um, also um, about another uh, op- another occasion where I discovered someone, the Stasi had tried to recruit them and they'd refused um, that was a woman that uh, an artist again that I'd met at um, a reception in in Leipzig, which had been set up by the by the foreign ministry for us to meet people, and so I'd met her, and so and she was nice, and we could talk about art, which was a thing I was interested in. Anyway, it turned out she was a people's artist, residence in an resident in an agricultural cooperative, and that's an area that I didn't know anything about, and I was quite interested to learn. So I asked her if I could come and visit her. And she said, yes, come come over. I'd be delighted to see you. So I made an appointment and went and had uh, went to her cooperative and had tea with her. And she showed me around and we talked about things. And we got on pretty well. And uh, so I said, well, you know, I'd love to visit you again. She said, yes, yeah, come back. It'd be lovely to see you again. So that was the sort of tone of the exchange. So then I made a date and I went back to see her again. And this time she was still friendly, but she said to me, look, I have to say, I have to ask you not to come and visit me again. She said, you know, as I'm an artist, I'm a sensitive person. And you talk about places you go and places you've seen and countries that I have no chance of ever visiting. And I find it really painful. So I have to ask you, I feel like I feel like a bird in a cage, she said. So I have to ask you, please don't come and visit me again. So I thought, well, that's fair enough, you know, so I understood that. But, of course, when I got hold of my Stasi file, I found what the real story was. And the story was that after my visit, she'd been visited by a Stasi operative who had said, what are you doing meeting this foreigner? What are the circumstances of the visit? How are the circumstances of the contact? What's going on? So, I mean, they thought I was probably, you know, trying to recruit her if I was an intelligence agent, but I wasn't. But anyway, so she told them quite truthfully what had happened and reported, because, I mean, all this is in my file. And uh, then uh, then they said, good, well, that's very useful. We'd like you to maintain contact with Frau Boyd, and we'd like you to develop the relationship, and we'd like you to ask her certain questions, and we'd like you to report back to us, please. 
And she said, well, thank, thank you. No, I don't want to do that. I'm an artist. I don't want to do that. And uh, she's not so interesting and I'm not interested in her. She got, hasn't got a family and actually she doesn't know much about art. And so, no, I don't want to pursue a relationship with her. Thank you very much. And so they, they had to leave it at that. They couldn't force her to do it. And so that was interesting to learn about. Yeah, no, that, that really interesting e- examples there. You know, as as you sort of said earlier, you you were you had journalist contacts in uh, East Germany as well, and it was sort of like, well, I know what you're doing, you know what I'm doing, and you knew that they were going to report back to the um, the Stasi. But it it sounds like they reported back in very positive uh, terms about you as well. Yes, I mean that's what I was. That- that was I was amazed. I was wonder- it was wonderful to read that. They were, they were very sympathetic and very positive. They weren't out to get me. They were just reporting, reporting faithfully. They had to report, um, and they all the things they said about me were nice. They all said my German was good and I was charming, and uh, that uh, I was attractive, that I was well groomed, I was well dressed. You know, I was an interesting character, and uh, so all those things they they said about me. And so Stasi built up this profile of me with all that material in it. Um, but yes, they were they were reporting. The thing was the journalist in particular. I think I knew I had three who became really quite good journalist friends. And one was the editor of Für Dich, which was the women's uh, newspaper, and one was a fellow who was the deputy editor of the of the f- of foreign affairs paper, and one was a reporter in the Berliner Zeitung, the daily daily paper and uh, so I uh, they were interesting I mean I'd been a journalist I knew what their profession was about I had plenty of things to ask them about and I could learn from them and also I was also seeking to place some material with them um, on Australia and I succeeded to a small extent not very extensively um, but um, you know, it was interesting to to read their reports of what they thought. I mean, and for for example, the the woman in Fürdich, she reported that um, she said, you know, it was interesting. She said, I I talked a lot about my, my my boyfriend, and I talked about family things, and I didn't talk much about political things. And I asked her about her family, and I you know asked her about her husband, and she said, should I think? You know, this is just a woman who's new to town and is looking for some women friends. I think that's what she's on about. And so that was absolutely spot on. That's exactly what, you know, although I also had a a professional um, interest in the relationship, but they they all became friends, um, you know, so in different ways. We spent more and more time together and talked together and had coffees together. And um, that was the sort of things that I enjoyed doing. That was, and that was my work as well. Yeah. And the the file's quite interesting because it she does sort of show some concern about your interest and friendliness towards her husband. That's right. <laughs> yes, I met her husband, and um, you know she introduced me to him, and uh, so naturally, you know, I sort of was polite to him and as charming as I could be, and then I'd ask her about him and how he was, and uh, you know, and what his background was, and so I was just generally interested. So that made you know, oh, she thinks yeah, I'm after I'm after her husband, but I actually wasn't at all. <laughs> I, th- I, th- I think my favourite line from the from from the file is is where it comments. She's not from a prudish point of view, as borne out by the jokes she tells. <laughs> That's right, yes. That was when she they were saying that I I liked food and drink, but I didn't drink much, you know, and that wasn't from a prudish point of view. Yes, that's right. So I yeah, I tell jokes, I tell jokes in German, tell jokes in English. You know, it's one of the things I sort of do to be entertaining and good company. And there were some terrific jokes in in East Germany. I have to say, you know, they were, you know, there was a good cabaret that continued in East Berlin, and that I never actually got to go to it, and I should have, because that was a lovely sort of underground current of um, implicit criticism of the regime, but done in very clever ways. And there were a lot of um, terrific jokes which were sort of against the regime, which East Germans would tell, and I, I enjoyed those jokes, and I enjoyed it retelling them myself, you know. Do you want to hear one? Yes, we do. <laughs> well, one of the ones I, I – one I liked very much was about how um, 
Willy Stoff, you know, who was the, the prime minister, and um, Erich Honecker, who was head of the party. They both thought they should really get to know what the people really thought of them. So they went and disguised themselves and were completely unrecognisable and went and sat in the underground and um, were listening to what people were saying. And suddenly a little old lady who was sitting opposite them leant forward and said, Hä, ich kenne euch die beide. Du bist der Willi und du bist der Erich. And so they thought, oh, you know, I recognize you. I know who you are. You're Willi and you're Eric. So they thought, oh, shit, someone seems seen through our disguise. So they quickly got off the train and went and disguised themselves even more. And the next day came on the train again. And this time, an old man was sitting opposite them. And he leant forward and said, I kenne euch die beide. Du bist der Willi und du bist der Eric. And so again, so they said, na, wieso? How do you know? He said, huh, ich bin der Milke. And Milke was head of the security agency. So, so was their, their, <laughs> their, their top spy had seen through their disguise and knew exactly who they were. So that was a sort of nice nice joke that people would tell, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's great. That's great. Because I've heard that the cabaret was sort of allowed almost like a, a – safety valve yes that's right i don't know whether that's true or not well that's what they said and i think that was true i as i say never got to actually go myself i had planned to but never sort of quite got around of it another wonderful joke that i really love is you know in the middle of berlin mitte there's the um the Funkturm, the um, broadcasting tower which is like a ball glass ball on top of you know a stand and eric honecker's office was in there and the story goes that uh, at dawn one morning, he was working away already in his office, and he suddenly heard a voice saying, Good morning, Eric. I'm so happy to see you working away for the good of the party and the people. Yeah, I'll be with you, and I'll look after you, and I'll shine on you right through the day and keep you warm. And he said, Who's that speaking? And the son said, it's me, the son. I'm talking, Eric. I'll look after you. She said, oh, thank you very much, son. Anyway, he got on with his work and he was there all day. And at sundown, he was still there and the sun was going down. So he, he said, oh, oh, thank you, son, for looking after me so well during the day. I really appreciate it. And the son said, piss off, asshole. I'm in the West now. <laughs> just, just, just <laughs> that's a great one that, that that's always a favorite of mine that one it is good yeah, yeah but I also it, it strikes me as being interesting because I'm an Australian you know and we know how to swear I mean I sound English but that's my heritage but I'm now Australian and Arschloch being the worst word in German that you could call someone the rudest thing seems to me so piss weak They've got to have worse words than that. So I thought, well, sure, Germans can do better than asshole. But anyway, that's the way it is. <laughs> that's great. I mean, what what I I I love about the file is it's almost like a um, performance review. It, some some of the bits of it, you know, where, where they say, "Oh, yeah, she's really good at building contacts," and. Uh, she knew how to bring personal matters into the conversation in order to develop trust quickly. They were trying to build up as good a picture of me as they could. I mean, they said quite clearly at the beginning, because they were working under GDR laws, and the law says you have to set out what is the purpose of this investigation. After all, you're committing funds to this exercise, so you have to justify it. So at the very beginning, it set out what they were what they were trying to do. And they wanted to find out about me, whether I was intelligence agent. They wanted to know what my personal um, political situation was, what my attitudes to what the GDR were, um, you know, what my family relationships were like, what my relationship with my own government was. So all those things they wanted to find out. And so, you know, they, they built up that, that, that very accurate sort of portrait of me one way or the other by bits that they gleaned from my various conversations. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 one of the other ones that I'm just picking out a few here that I, I found interesting was the – uh, deputy editor of the foreign affairs newspaper in East Germany. He, he received permission to invite you to his weekend dacha. Mm, that was nice, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and what, what the the bit I particularly found um, funny was you gave him 
at the end of your posting, you gave him a copy of George Orwell's Animal Farm to read. That's right. Yeah. And in his report on the content of the book, he wondered at the end whether it might be seen as a critique of socialism. I know. I read that and I thought, well, it was he either thick and didn't see that it was a critique of socialism or he had to cover his tracks because he'd received the book and he'd read it and he reported on his content, obviously, to Stasi. And uh, so, therefore, I think he was sort of covering himself in sort of innocence to say, well, was this, is this what it was about? But I think he bloody knew exactly what it was about. I think you're right. I think it was the covering of tracks. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's it's also the 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 mundane uh pieces in, in the file around, you know, when they're shadowing you and they've <laughs> got you know, there, there's a piece in there, you know, when you're being trowed in Magdeburg, which is <laughs> uh almost uh sounds like a comedy. Yeah, that was extraordinary, wasn't it? you know, to read what they recorded. I mean, to begin with, you know, they, they were tailing me from the time I hit the town boundary and drove into Magdeburg. And so they say, you know, they were tailing me, but I went the long way down a one-way street twice and made it hard for them to follow me. <laughs> so he said that, that showed that I was unfamiliar with the town. I mean, there it was. So then when I got to the hotel, they reported that I parked, that I took my suitcase out of the car, took it, I checked in. The, the room, they knew the room number of the key that I was given. Then I came out. And then I walked walked around the town and uh, I didn't seem to be looking for anything particular. I bought a postcard. I sat down on the steps of the Rathaus and I wrote out this postcard and I posted it. And then they were obviously retrieved it from the post box because they reproduced my postcard then in the file. And then... They, they said I went into a telephone box and made a telephone call. Um, they couldn't apps, I looked up the number in the telephone directory. They weren't they couldn't quite see what who, what the name was, but they saw when I dialed the number, they saw the page on the telephone directory where I found the information. And when I dialed the number, they registered the last three digits, in fact, of the number I dialed. So that afterwards they were able to go back into the telephone box and using that information track down through the telephone directory who it was I'd been trying to call. In fact, it wasn't a successful call. So, I mean, that was extraordinary. And then the thing that really struck me was um, at, at, at another time I was with some friends and uh, we were, we went to have a picnic. We went to a shop, we bought some food and wine, as one does. And then we went to this forest and we walked down, the, the four of us, this very quite narrow track into the forest and to a little clearing. And we set up our, set down our rug and we got the food out and we were eating it and chatting. Well, all this, this guy was noticing and recording. He even was obviously close enough that he could read the label on the wine bottle of the, what wine it was we were drinking. I had no idea, of course, I was being tailed at the time. They did it very surreptitiously, but just and that's extraordinary when you read that report later, isn't it? It is, it is, and that's not just being tailed. I mean, he's breathing down your neck there. Yeah, yeah, must have been so close, or must have had very good binoculars, but whatever it was, you know, I mean, I had no idea I was being tailed at all. Yeah, yeah. And then the other occasion, which was quite interesting, was I was, I was invited um, at in Magdeburg when I was invited, the same occasion, I was invited to give a talk to a, an English conversation group. And it shows that there were four accounts of my talk in my file. One was from the official Stasi agent who was posted in the room next to the room where I was speaking, and he was recording what I was saying. Uh, very badly, because as he said, the, the batteries ran out on his on his microphone. The, the battery recharger didn't work, so he got a very imperfect recording. Also, he didn't speak in English, so he had no idea who was speaking when or what I was saying. So that was absolutely hopeless, you know. But there were three people in the room who were in the audience who each also filed a report on what I had said and the tone of my conversation and so on. So Stasi had really four versions of what I said. So they were each, you know, could have been checked against the other for veracity. Luckily, they all tell the same story. 
but extraordinary, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's interesting the the depth of or the the sort of number of informers they had, these unofficial collaborators, I presume most most of these people were. Yes. That that were reporting back. And in that meeting, those two people probably didn't know that somebody else was reporting back as well. So it was almost like a double check to make sure that well, I think that's right. I think they probably didn't know. That's right. But what was interesting was that the fellow who'd invited me to come to give this talk, he'd actually fronted up at the embassy in in, uh, in Berlin and invited me personally. Um, it, well, he asked me to go back to his apartment with a few of the members of the group to have a couple of drinks afterwards. And of course, I did. And there's no record anywhere of anything that took, took place uh, at, at that time. So either the people who were reporting on me weren't the same people who then came back for a drink, or they recognize they had dual functions um, i don't know about that. yeah or maybe had some suspicions about a couple of members of the group and didn't include them on the invite list i don't know quite quite possibly <laughs> who, knows? who knows um but there's there's so many amusing stories in there if we can just capture a, a, a couple or a few more of them the, the other one was the um your birthday party Oh, yes. Oh, that was terrific. You know, I had a fairly big birthday party. I invited a lot of people and it was a typical sort of Australian party, you know, where people came and there was sort of drinks to self-serve on the counter and there were a bit of food around to eat and people sort of mingled around and chatted amongst themselves. We had some music playing and so on. Anyway, this chap, oh, I can't remember, I couldn't actually work out who it was from the report, but he was one of the guests and he reports that it was a strange party because people weren't sort of introduced to each other so it wasn't the sort of german sort of party and uh, and there was a lot of uh, alcohol around not much food so he found that strange because of course that's very un-german you wouldn't do that in a german party but um mark wood who was the reuters correspondent at, by that stage in in east berlin mark brain had gone over to west berlin east mark and west mark we used to call them <laughs> Oh, yeah, the Deutschmark and the Ostmark. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. So anyway, we had two marks. Anyway, so Mark Wood obviously took this fellow in, in hand and being polite said, look, come and let's have a look. And I had a pretty impressive collection of artworks and including I have this old – old manual um, sort of cash register. It's a beautiful thing, great bronze heavy thing with a handle. And so Mark was showing him this. And when you turn the handle, it, a bell rings and the door, the drawer opens so you can put money in if it's being used as a cash register. But of course, it was now not being used as a cash register. And when you close the drawer again, it locks again. And next time you wind the handle, it opens again with a ring of a bell and the drawer comes open. Anyway, he was convinced there was a, a, a camera hidden in this device and that every time the, the, the handle was turned and the bell rang, he was being photographed. <laughs> Brilliant. It wasn't, wasn't, of course, anything like that. But he was, you know, so sort of trying to find out things. Obviously, so what he had to report, he reported. But there wasn't very much to report. Yeah, yeah. I suppose he had to justify his um, his his purpose there. Um, so you are originally there for a two year posting, and then you asked for a further year. But there is there is an effort by the East Germans to try and discredit you to the Australian government. Yes, that was very spooky. Um, uh, we had another member of staff that was coming from Canberra, and before coming, he, as usual, went and called on the East German ambassador in Canberra uh, and uh, you know, said, I'm going, I'm looking forward to going to your country. It's the usual sort of courtesy call. Anyway, they, they said, oh, look, the ambassador's not here at the moment. Look, we really want you to wait. He's coming back. He wants to meet you. Um, you know, we're only junior staff, so please wait, wait. So, my my colleague waited and the ambassador came back and the ambassador said, yes, I'm very pleased to meet you. I want to say, I'm sure you're going to have a great time in Berlin. I have to say, your colleague in the embassy, Frau Boyd, um, she's obviously very happy there. She is really enjoying herself. Yes, she's having an affair with a, uh, with a, a professor at the Humboldt University. So, of course, she's very happy. Yes, I'm sure you're going to be very happy too. It was very much in that tone. 
So the poor chap, he thought, what do I do about this? I've been given this information by the East Germans. So he felt he had to go to our security people and say, look, this is what the East Germans have told me about Sue. I just reported for what it's worth, um, but up to you. That was our security people in the Department of Foreign Affairs in Canberra. So anyway, so they thought, oh, shit, well, this, this could be could be difficult stuff. So they sent a report to my ambassador, to Malcolm Morris, and said, look, can you please check with Sue? And this is the story that we've been told. Please, can you see if you can find out if it's true? Because obviously, if it was true, it was fairly serious, you know, real sort of security breach stuff. So my ambassador said, Sue, can you come for a walk with me? Because, of course, the embassy was bugged. We never talked within the embassy about anything really mattered. So we went for a walk, and he told me the story. And I said, no, it's absolutely not true. I'm not having an affair with anybody. Um, it's not true at all. But I said, but I'll tell you what is a bit funny. My friend Marika, who is in the Dutch embassy, we're very close to each other. We do a lot of things together. We look quite alike. We've got the same sort of short, dark hair. She's as smartly dressed as I am. She's having an affair with somebody and could be a professor. I'm not sure. But so maybe they've got us confused. You know, maybe it's her. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, so my ambassador reported back to Canberra. No, there's nothing in this story. Don't worry about it. Sue's not up to any hanky panky, and everything's fine. You know, so it it passed. But had it been true, they would have recalled me, and I wouldn't therefore have been able to stay for the third year. So there was obviously some intent in what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. And you you tell this great story of uh, you and uh, Marika swapping your identity cards because you are so similar and getting through the uh, Bornholmstrasse checkpoint with uh, each other's ID cards. Yeah, exactly. We thought, well, let's test them. Let's see how, how clever these guys are. So we you know, swapped our ID cards and drove through in tandem, one car and the other. So, you know, but they didn't pick up anything. They didn't realise that the person showing them the ID card wasn't actually the person who it purported to be. We got away with that one. We said that was just for fun, yeah. I mean, I, I guess when, when you started looking at your file, were you thinking that you might find something on Klaus and Karen Peters in there? Yes, exactly. I was, I yeah. And I, what, I, what I didn't think, well, it, it wasn't only Klaus. It was after I'd finished reading my file that I realised there were really significant omissions. And the fact that I was really close to uh, Klaus and Karen and their two children um, – I spent a lot of time with them. I travelled with them. We travelled to Czechoslovakia together. We'd been around places around the GDR together. It was really odd that they weren't in my file, that they weren't reporting on me. And so I really wondered why that was. So when I went back to Berlin in 2006, um, I asked Klaus. I said, look, you know, one thing puzzles me. I've got my file and this is, and you're not in it. And, you know, I, I, I really wondered if you were reporting on me to Stasi. He said, no, 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 I wasn't doing any for Stasi. Oh, no, no. He said, no, listen, this is the story. And he told me the story, which was that the Stasi had approached the director of the orchestra, the intendant, and said, your orchestra travels internationally. They go everywhere. They go to every capital city, and there's great opportunities for them to spy for the mother country. So we would like to ask them to spy for us, please. And the intendant had said, don't do that. The, the orchestra is very high quality. An orchestra has to play together with mutual understanding and respect, and they have to know all about each other. And if you put that sort of constraint on them, you will actually damage the, the, the way that the orchestra performs. And the orchestra uh, earns very high regard for the GDR through the quality of their music. And they earn a lot of hard currency for the GDR through the quality of their performances internationally and their reputation. If you ask them to do this, you will destroy their reputation. So don't do it. And uh, he won. So Stasi backed off and they didn't, they weren't asked to do anything. So they were all, none of them were working for Stasi and they were all actually sort of protected as it were. So that was the story. So I was just really interested to hear that, um, but also delighted to know that my judgment that on them, that they were real, real friends um, and uh, were really terrific people, that judgment was sound. I was very heartened to find that out. 
Yeah, no, I can, I, I, I can imagine that. Um, particularly, you know, that, that, as you said, it was your second day, you sit down and somebody tries to get friendly with you and you're immediately suspicious, but you know, your, um, your sense of, uh, trustworthiness was, uh, correct. Yep. Yep. And they proved over a long period of time. I mean, we obviously spent a lot of time together and they're still really good friends. I mean, I went back to Berlin, um, last year. And I wanted to check my book with them. I wanted to check that what I was writing was accurate, you know. So we sat down, and um, uh, one of one of the uh, one of the members of the family speaks good English, and so he sort of translated into German as, as we were going along to make sure everything was clear. And uh, no, they said no, no, that's all right, that's all correct. No, we're happy for you to, to to write all that. So that was, you know, I feel I've sort of covered my covered myself there, and I'm not writing anything about them that they wouldn't want to be in the public domain yeah i i i uh, found interesting your uh your buddy gough whitlam turns up again in 1976 although he's the former australian prime minister he's on an official visit to the gdr yes that's right uh because he's still a member of parliament you know and um yeah so he he's coming and the ambassador gets Mike, malcolm morris gets very excited about his coming and says oh you know he was the one who recognized the gdr the party must love him you know he's a labor party man and i'm sure he wants to meet the brotherhood over here and uh, he wants an official program which has him meeting all these people and i said no 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 i know him he really wants to come and see the pergamon museum that's what this is about you see <laughs> so the i said no 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 i know better you know we've got to put together a good program for him so i said all right well we put together a pro- official program but we still have to keep time for him to go and see the pergamon museum because i know this is exactly what he wants to do and sure enough i was sent over to west berlin to pick him up in the official car and bring him over the east and he'd seen the program and he said so he said this program is dreadful when am i going to see the pergamon museum and i said oh well, goff actually we've <laughs> i know that so we've actually set aside a whole day for you to see the pergamon museum but you have to do these other things as well so he said oh yeah i suppose i do you know and so uh, so it went very well so uh, malcolm morris and i went with him around the museum because he's hugely impressive and hugely knowledgeable about ancient civilizations and it was just a wonderful time we spent with him uh, in the museums i'm so glad he came i hadn't i hadn't realized that he had uh, encyclopedic knowledge of ancient history but mm. uh, that's one of the many details i pick up in your book sue so good it's all it's all good stuff so you reached the end of your posting in 1979 were you sorry to leave east germany um, yes, I mean I'd enjoyed it very much, and um, but you know, in professional terms, a post is three years. Three years, it's, that's it, you know. And I'd, it was two years, in fact. So it was a hardship post, and I got an extra year out of it. Um, but no, it was it was time to go home and to get on with the rest of my career. You know, you expect accept that when you're in the foreign service. Hmm. Yeah, and how much had East Germany changed during your posting? Had it changed much, or was more or less the same when well, you started? I think it was more or less the same. I mean, there were some changes that were in the air, you know. Um, I sort of felt this couldn't last. There had to be a breakthrough of some kind, but I couldn't see how that breakthrough could happen. I couldn't see how it could be done from the inside. You know, I'm not, I, I had no idea about what was, in, what was in fact going to happen 10 years later, but I knew that it was likely to change. And things were changing too. I mean, uh, pop music, for example, and young people's activities. I mean, they could see television from the West. They could hear radio. They knew all about modern music. They were making fantastic modern music of their own. Um, you know, their, their clothes sense was changing. Um, they were being influenced by the West. So, you know, the place was changing to that extent, but I really couldn't imagine how the major breakthrough could happen. But I sensed in my bones that it was bound to happen sometime. Yeah. Um, so, Sue, so t- tell us about your, your book, because this is just one chapter in uh, your book, which is the story of your life as a diplomat. That's right. The book is actually now out. 
I have a copy of the thing in my hot little hands. Um, so it's just a wonderful. It's the first time, first time I've written a book, so this is very exciting. But yes, so it's really a, um, a, an autobiography, yeah, but it's really about my time in the foreign service. Um, because, you know, I teach at the university here in Western Australia and my international relations students are always asking me, what's life like in the foreign service? How do I get into it? What else can you do overseas apart from being a diplomat? Um, what's it like being a woman in the foreign service? What was it like for you? I mean, you were pioneering. You were one of the few women in the foreign service. You know, what was it like? And did you have a sex life? And, you know, all those sort of things they ask you. And uh, so I thought, well, let me write Let me write a book about all this, which I'll cover all this in the book, and then they can see what it's like to be in an embassy, what our role is, what we actually do with ourselves, and what our lives are like. They made the, the publisher made me cut out the bits about my sex life. So I jokingly say my next book is going to be the sex life of a spinster ambassador, but, you know, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> So the, the the book is called Not Always Diplomatic, An Australian Woman's Journey Through International Affairs. You've been listening to Susan Boyd. There will be links in the show notes to the book so that you can purchase it and help support Cold War Conversations as well. But Sue, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And we have further photos, videos and information on this episode in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Don't forget, if you'd like to get one of those Cold War Conversations coasters, help keep us on the air, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Thanks again to all our financial supporters of the podcast, but a special thanks to our Politburo level Patreons, who are Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, and Jeffrey Jones, who are supporting us at 30 US dollars per month. Thank you.